Welcome. Thank you so much for being here today, whether you're joining us live or if you're going to join us later at a time that works a little better for you. We're so excited that you're here. Um, excuse us for some technical difficulties. This is our first seminar. So just like with anything, everything has a few kinks, but we're going to work all those out. And so, like I said, we're so excited that you're here today. Um, the today's talks are about mental health strategies for you and your athlete. And as I mentioned, this is the first of many of these that we are going to be hosting. So we hope that you'll check your email for future events, but just so that you're aware, we're gonna host this quarterly in 2021. So we plan to have one in June, March, skip that one, sorry, March, June, September, and December of 2021. And after this time, you're gonna get a survey, obviously, because we wanna make sure that you get your continuing education, but also because we wanna know what you are interested in hearing more about as we plan out our 2021 calendar. I should probably introduce myself. My name is Becca Hibbert. I am the Director of Sports Medicine for Spooner Physical Therapy. And if you've never heard of us or you're just starting to hear a little bit more about us, we are located in Phoenix, Arizona with many locations throughout the Valley here. We are all about collaboration. We understand that sports medicine is a team endeavor. And when everybody can bring their strengths, their skills and their expertise to the table, that is how we best serve athletes. We're very excited because we know we have a lot of athletic trainers who are joining us today. And we know you guys are the front lines of that sports medicine team and working with those athletes. So we're excited that you're here. We're happy to work with you more, but also to provide resources like this event today in order to work better as a team to discuss <clears throat> topics that are important to each and every one of us on that sports medicine team. Today, we are hosting at our newest sports medicine location, which is the Fisher Institute. And if you've never been here, it looks a little different than probably any other physical therapy clinic that you've ever been in. As an athletic trainer myself, I best describe this as a large college athletic training room. We have physical therapists, athletic trainer, and strength and conditioning all housed within about 20,000 square feet here. And obviously what we're able to do here is take the athlete from beginning to end of an injury process, but also through our off-season training like our MLB or NFL programs, we're also able to work together on both sides, strength and conditioning, the rehab side, and make sure that we are treating the whole athlete. Speaking of the whole person, when we sat down and discussed what we wanted to do for this first seminar, it became pretty obvious that these were important topics to talk about. 2020 has been a very difficult year to say the least. And obviously for some of you, unfortunately you have been furloughed for a time. You may still be out of work, or if you have been working, you have more responsibilities, more stress, and you're not seeing any increase in your staffing or salary to meet those demands. As an athletic trainer who, myself, who had to end up kind of leaving the traditional setting of athletic training, when I left, I didn't understand that it was because of burnout, because we weren't having those conversations then. And so for us, it's really important to start that conversation today. That's why we're so excited that Brett Fisher is going to talk to all of you about burnout, strategies, um, things to be looking for either within yourself or within your colleagues, and how we can try and avoid that in a profession that it's very hard and a lot of hours are involved. And then we know as sports medicine professionals how important your athletes are to you. You are with them potentially more than just about anybody else, especially depending on if they're in season. And so you are seeing things probably before anybody else is. And that's why we're excited to have Dr. Strickland here to talk with us about signs to look for in the athletes, questions to ask them, and to make sure that we're getting our athletes the correct care when they're dealing with mental health issues. So how today's gonna work is each of our speakers are gonna talk for about 30 minutes. And then we got a lot of great questions already through the registration process. But if you have questions throughout, please feel free to put those in the comments if you're joining us live. And we're gonna try and answer as many questions as we can. Like I said, we're so happy you're here. <laughs> Thank you for waiting a little bit of time to come in and join us. And we're so hopeful that you're gonna get maybe one to two pieces of information that you can bring back, whether that's to your professional or personal life. 
So without further delay, let me introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Brett Fisher, who along with his wife, Stephanie, founded the Fisher Institute in 1997. And we are very lucky that he and his team here joined our Spooner Sports Medicine team in 2020. Brett is a licensed physical therapist, a certified athletic trainer, and a strength and conditioning specialist. He has worked with and treated athletes in the high school, collegiate, and professional setting, including working with the Chicago Cubs, the PGA, and currently is the PT consultant for the Arizona Cardinals. Brett's expertise has led to national and international speaking engagements, even all the way into Asia. Brett has won many awards, such as winning a television Emmy in 2014 for his work with the NFL. And he is the inventor of the most effective and versatile abdominal device sold nationally and internationally, the Abdolly. Please welcome Brett Fisher. Thank you. We're good. I'm only one athletic trainer. I can't get to you all. Feelings of frustration. Another parent calling me about their son trying to play on Friday when he's not ready to play. Feelings of anger. When is the season over? I am so worn down. Feelings of being tired. I hate my job. This is too much. Feeling of being overwhelmed. I work so freaking hard and they bust me on the stupidest crap, this tedious stuff. Feeling of being overlooked. Brett, what? <laughs> being on edge. If you experience some of these emotions on a consistent basis in your job, you're fighting burnout. You're fighting burnout. First of all, I wanna thank Tim Spooner for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, big thanks to John Selinger and Rebecca Hibbert for putting all this together. I really appreciate you guys, but I'm Brett Fisher. Um, I'm happy to be here. Like Becca said, I am an athletic trainer. Um, I've worked in all kinds of settings. Been very fortunate to do that in the college and high school ranks. Um, and then we opened this facility and sold and worked with now Tim Spooner at Spooner with my wife, Stephanie. And then no way am I an expert to actually speak on this. I'm not a mental specialist like we'll hear next from Dr. Mark Strickland. But I am a soldier and I've been fighting burnout for 38 years doing what we do. And as athletic trainers, no one knows better about the stresses of this. And even everybody in the medical field for now, even physical therapists, nurses, things like that, there's a lot of stress out there. So my goal today is what? Let's talk about burnout. What is it? Okay. What are some of the symptoms? What are some of the causes? All right. And we know a lot of these things, but what the heck can we do about it? What can we even do and challenge ourselves to even go about this? And that's why for us at the Spooner uh, Institute, we, just, we really feel like this is an important time of the year, given what's going on in society, that we talk about these things. First thing I want to talk about is, is, is some of the, the causes of what we're going through. Long hours. I mean, a lot of us know this. As athletic trainers, um, I think we got back at 4 a.m. last week after a game and you're back out at eight at seven o'clock in the morning. It's long hours. So if you're in the healthcare profession now, it's long hours, okay? Poor salaries for athletic trainers, still there. As a healthcare professional, unfortunately, the salaries haven't caught up yet. In fact, it's kind of scary if you take the amount of hours that an athletic trainer works and divide it by the pay, it comes close to minimum wage for these expert people. So it's, there's a lot of stress that comes with that financially to put all this time into it. Three, tough working conditions. You could be outside in the rain, the cold. You could be in a situation where you have very little equipment. Um, you're dealing with super big people like we do at the Arizona Cardinals. Those are tough conditions and you do it day in and day out. It takes a toll. So these are all causes that can go, go us. Obviously we're in a giving profession. We're always giving out energy. We're always treating other people's problems, all right? Which is what we like to do, but it's also a cause of why we may have a lot more stress in our lives. Five, politics on the job. We all have them, right? But really an athletic trainer has a unique job. They may have an AD, coaches, they have the parents. There's multiple things that come your way that you have to deal with as a healthcare professional in, in sports medicine. And, and you need to recognize that those are unique jobs. Some jobs you have one boss, 
For a lot of athletic trainers, you have multiple people you have to deal with and really answer to. Six, as athletic trainers, we have poor family and friends social time. Because our time is so short, we seem to like we get less and less time with our friends. We don't make time for those things. And it happens because of our, of our time of what, what we're doing. Number seven, insufficient staffing is a very big, big problem for athletic trainers. Um, any really a healthcare professional we're looking at now with COVID, people are being just stressed out because they have too many patients for the healthcare professionals. And that was obviously the last one, COVID. Um, we know all well that the athletic trainer has so many responsibilities. And now, even more. Um, the athletic trainers at the Arizona Cardinals do an amazing job. Uh, they do contract tracing on the plane, coming off the plane, we have trackers and all the testing that goes on. Those are all extra things that they have to do that adds to stress in their lives. And it's, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot. And it came all at once. So what, what is burnout? It, it describes psychologically as emotional exhaustion. Basically, you're on empty. You got nothing to give. We see now a depersonalization of the athlete, almost like the athletic trainer becomes callous toward life. And before you know it, you came in this profession wanting to help everybody. And all of a sudden now you're like, oh, I just, I don't feel anything anymore. And it's, it's kind of a scary thing. And number three, I've seen this is that people have a decreased perception of their accomplishments. They lose confidence in themselves because they're so busy. They can't get to them to do all the things they want to do. And before you know it, their outcomes are not the way they want to be. And before you know it, they're going, this isn't going to work. And it's like this, almost like this hopelessness feeling that occurs for a lot of athletic trainers. So all this leads to what? Decrease in work quality. Increase in substance abuse, drinking, drugs, things like that we're seeing now. Three is the increase in depression symptoms. And this is kind of the eye opener for me that, that Dr. Strickland uh, really taught me over the years. It's not just feeling sad or feeling those emotions, but uh, changes in sleep, changes in eating, too much, too little, emotional eating, um, feeling of hopelessness is obviously one of them, losing interest in the things that you'd like to do in your life, all of a sudden that you used to like to do that, you're like, I didn't want to do that anymore, okay? And number three is getting pleasure from even just doing our daily work as an athletic trainer and the things we used to love to do is all of a sudden now a burden. And that's kind of the worst feeling getting up early in the morning and having to go somewhere and go, I don't want to be here. So now that I depressed you all, I made you feel horrible, all right? What can we do? I mean, it, it, this sounds really depressing. And, and what, like, how are you gonna change my job? I have my hours, how are you gonna change things? Man, today, I just wanna hear and just say, give some suggestions, some strategies, kind of fight through this now. Um, I mean, first, you gotta sit down and back up and really take a good look at your life. Identify and modify these stresses we just talked about. Really sit down in your time and say, okay, what is going on? What are these things we're talking about today? And take a real good inventory and find out what you got going on, all right? Um, a, a great quote, which I wanna start with, and I put it on the Instagram too, is life is 10% of what happens to you, but 90% of how you react to it. Life is 10% of what happens to you, but 90% on how you react to it. And I think once we get that perspective, you understand like, I, I can do this. I can get this now because when we're in the midst of it, it don't feel like 10%, right? It feels like the whole world's coming down. So one of the first things we need to do is first of all, are you in the right profession? Because maybe you're not, maybe you're not, maybe you should not be an athletic trainer or a physical therapist or a nurse, whatever you may do, just because it's not the right setting for you. So what's, what's required of an athletic trainer? And it's really a unique job. It's, it's so special in so many ways. Um, you have to deal with so many types of personalities. As far as athletes, that's a wide spectrum. We talk about it all the time in the training room. Um, but you have your ADs, you have your assistant ADs, you have travel secretaries, you have coaches, parents, you have everybody you got to deal with. And if you're a person that doesn't like dealing with multiple personalities, you're going to struggle. You're going to really struggle. Um, you got to get over things quickly and stay focused on the job. You just can't take yourself so seriously. Um, but the things are going to happen so fast. You can't, you can't linger on and you can't stay on it because something else may be coming on the next injury in the game. You have to be able to move on in your life. Um, obviously being organized, think about an athletic trainer. They're there before practice, prepping out, taping, rehab, making sure there's enough water, temperature gauge, phone calls coming in, 
getting everybody ready, get on the field, take care of the players on the practice field, afterwards clean up, treatment. There's a million things going on at once. And if you're not an organized person, it's straight chaos. And chaos creates stress. Four, you gotta be able to laugh. You gotta have moments on the sidelines, in the training room, where you have fun. And if you don't have fun, what you're doing, it's, it's, you hate, you hate life. And so that's why it's an important thing. I really believe you got to love sports. If you're going to be doing sports, you get to love it. Cause there's times you're sitting out there going, what the hell am I doing? It's cold and it's raining, but you love what you're doing. You know, you have to love healthcare. And I think um, one other one I want to add to this is, is adding, you have to be able to communicate to people and set expectations to them. For example, especially in the high school setting, you have a player and the player's hurt and you know that it's like a four week injury, but to get the parent wants them to play this Friday, you have to be able to sit down to them and say, no, you're actually jeopardizing your son or daughter's you know, health of doing that. You have to have the confidence in yourself and the ability to communicate these things to somebody and say, no, I'm not gonna come to suppressor. I'm gonna go ahead and tell you what I really, really think is gonna happen and believe in what you're saying. So the bottom line is this, if you want to get and fight burnout, it's a fight, but it's not a fight one day. And I think about it and go on. No, it's a daily fight. You have to have strategies each and every day to fight this. Okay. I like this word here. You have to be deliberate, deliberately attack those areas in your life that you need to modify to make yourself feel like you're enjoying what you're doing. All right. Because if you don't, guess what happens? You can't give what you don't have. Okay. If you have nothing in the tank, you can't give it. So that's why it's such an important thing to do. So what are some of these strategies? Number one, like Pablo Picasso said, without great solitudes, no serious work is possible. You have to get quality personal time. I don't care how you get it. You got to figure it out somehow, some way. If you need to go to bed earlier so you can go and get up earlier, stay up later to do this time, however it works in your life, you have to get personal time. Some people like to journal. I don't, I'm not a great writer, so I don't, journal, but some people write and they be able to express themselves in words much easier. And it's, and it's really an outlet. Uh, meditation and, and, and Mark is an expert as, as far as explaining a lot of these, but there's so many ways of meditating um, to going from, you know, mindful meditation of certain things you want to think about to uh, breathing techniques, uh, guided imagery, meditation, things like that can really set your day on the right path. Okay. Five, pray, listen and talk to God. It works. It works. Six, read, 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 read. Read things that may uplift you, encourage you, things that make you feel better. Get things that go away from your day-to-day -day life. And seven, you have, to, you have to carve out time about thinking. Einstein did this, Newton did this, Bill Gates did this. And what they did is said, these times are unnegotiable. The phone's off, the TV's off, and they just thought. For me personally, it's our airplane, Ryan's our airplane has no Wi-Fi and actually everybody complains, but I love it because no one can get a hold of me. And I put my headphones on or I just sit there and lay there and I can just think. And for me, it's that time or early in the morning for me is time when I think, but find what time works for you and just get some think time. Just it doesn't be long, but just think about things. And it kind of gives you a different perspective of what you're looking at, okay? This right here is such an important thing is, is really having, it's hard as athletic trainers to have a lot of friends because we don't have a lot of time. Okay, I hate to say that, like really true good friends are gonna stick by you and understand you can't be there all the time. But you gotta kick it with your homies. You gotta be yourself and let loose and have fun, okay? It's such an important thing to have that in your life and with your family and have those moments. But you have to plan for them. You just, it doesn't just happen. You gotta be deliberate in being that time with your friends and your family. You'll enjoy life more. Mentor is such an important thing. Looking back at my career, I'm so blessed to have people who came into my life and they're mentors, for example, like my mom, I love her to death. I hope she's not watching. But like, you're tired? Just tell them you don't want to go in today. You take a day off. You've worked every day since July 21st. Mom, I can't do that. It's not my job. So my point is like, when you have mentors, make sure they know your environment and give you good advice. They've been there. They can say that. Now, with that said, you might have a mentor who's more of a business mentor, doesn't really totally understand athletic training, but they can give you some real good business advice. You can have people who are in athletic training really give you some good technical advice. Hey, on this ACL at three weeks, look for this and look for that. That's great. Or you may have a person who's in your life on how do I handle this coach who is like 
the biggest jerk in the world. How do I handle him? And there's people who went ahead of us to say, I think you can kind of try and do this and this and this. It's so important to establish certain people on your cell phone that you could dial up and say, hey, you got five minutes to talk to me. This is what's going on. Can you give me some perspective? And that's been a huge thing for me because we all can't know it all, but we know people in our lives who have done things, who've been successful, utilize them and start building your mentors, your people in your, your dials, okay? Keep in, building those up. Another thing, obviously, take care of yourself. I know it sounds so simple, but like sleep, diet, exercise, even things like yoga and massage, whenever you get a chance, take it. Find those moments when you can do those things for yourself because it is critically important. How you feel has a lot to do as how you think and do things, okay? So for example, for sleep, obviously, the, all the research has been showing, you gotta be around eight hours, give or take. You gotta get eight hours, okay? Um, don't overstimulate before bedtime. Like video games, they say aren't the best thing because it gets you kind of going, that's going things. Uh, read, listen, music before you go and get relaxed. Um, whatever floats your boat. For me, I like Pond Stars before I go to bed or travel TV shows. I don't know, they work for me. I just love travel shows where I can just kind of get my mind, just kind of drift off. And for my wife and I, we have a thing where after like eight o'clock, we don't really discuss business or things that are kind of getting us really going if we can. We try to do that before. And everything afterwards is kind of just like letting ourselves go down and just get ready to go and sleep. But uh, a dark, cool area to sleep, I know it sounds simple, but it, it does enhance sleeping quality, research has shown. So make your room dark, okay, as much as you can, make it cool and get rest. Now diet, obviously for an athletic trainer, um, this is tough because of our job. A lot of times we don't have access to places. Okay, and fast food places are usually the option sometimes for athletic trainers because we're on the run. But this is where our job is so special. We have to be, have special planning. You got to plan for your diet. You got to plan for your meals. You got to bring snacks. You got to do things that's going to really enhance your life and give you energy. You have to plan ahead on your diet, especially as an athletic trainer. And it's hard when you're traveling on a bus, you're doing things. Sometimes you don't have a whole lot of options to choose from but you gotta make the best of it and prepare for those times where you put certain things in your bag just to get you by, okay? Obviously exercise, they go, when can I find the time? Well, the good thing is athletic trainers, guess where we work at? Usually in an athletic, athletic setting. So you can have a gym maybe, some kind of weights. We usually have some kind of field. We can do something, we can be creative. We have the equipment, so to speak, to take care of ourselves. We have to find a time to do that. But when can I do that? For some of us, it's early in the morning, you know, before everything starts, you get it out of the way. For some of us, it's when, when players go to team meetings, find those 20 minutes to an hour and they go to team meeting. And for some, maybe it's after work. For me, I can't do that. I'm too dead tired and I, usually just, I, would, I would probably skip it. So I try and get mine in the morning. Everyone's different, but you got to find time for yourself, 20 minutes to an hour, three times a week. If you want to survive in this business, You've got to take care of yourself. You got to exercise at some point in time. Because if you don't, it's going to catch up to you. Okay. Obviously, we mentioned this before time management. Um, you, you got to be deliberate. And it's, it's everything. It's not just our work week, it's also our social calendar, it's our personal calendar, it's our meal plans. Everything like that is, is such an important thing to do. Um, for me, stress is when I am late. So my wife will tell you, I get to airports two hours in advance. For those of the Cardinals here, I'm, I'm at the first one on the airplane. I'm usually laying down, going to sleep or just hanging out. I, I hate to be late. It's stressful for me. So, but I always say plan ahead because things could happen and give yourself that lead way to do that. But um, like I said, as an ATC, we have, we have a special job. So it takes special preparation to, to get us to last a long time in our career. This to me is one of the biggest things now is take time to establish your priorities. What's a priority? Who and what are the most important things in your life? Think about that. Who are, who are the most important people in your life? What's the most important thing? Sit down and look at it. A great book for me was a book called Essentialism by Greg McNown. And he, he had a quote which kind of sums the book up in a lot of ways. He said, distinguishing the vital few from the trivial many. I'll, I'll read it again. He said, distinguish the vital few from the trivial many. And when you start doing that, you start figuring out what's really, really important here and what's not important, okay? 
Because when you really understand what's really important in your life, you start getting these priorities in your life set that are really, really important. So that takes us to the next point, our day-to-day -day life. Okay, now I have my priorities. This is important, that's not so important. But something small happens in the training room and it just pisses you off. What do you do? And there was a great analogy where there's a clear lake, a clear pond, and you throw a rock on the pond and what happens? You get the ripple effect, right? And everything's on the surface is really going and they can go for a long time. If you ever watch it, it can go for a long, long time. But that rock, if you're four feet deep, the water never changed, it stayed the same. It sounds crazy, but in my mind, when things get like that, I go, go deep, go deep. Things on the surface are always crazy, but they're, they're, not, they're not vital. The thing's deeper. I guess I say to myself, don't be shallow, Brett. <laughs> go deep in life. And when you, those things happen, when they really irritate you, you, go, at the end of the day, how important was that? Was I on top of the surface where things were kind of crazy? Or was I deep where it's kind of calm, quiet, going, yeah, it wasn't that important. You know what I mean? And I, it's a good reminder for me. It's a, it's a visual reminder for me when things get crazy. How important was that? You know, and it just gives me a perspective. I think the other thing too, which is important is this is learning to say no. Uh, for example, there's times where we, I know in training camp, we had treatments from eight o'clock to noon and it was during training camp and we stay away for a while. Don't see our families. And a player walks in at one till 12 who's usually single, hey, I need to get treated. And I've walked out, where are you going? I go, I'm going home and see my family and my dogs. <laughs> I need treatment. Well, guess what? I'm not gonna treat you. I was here all day, okay? When you start giving in on those things, that's taken away from you because people will steer your time. He had his opportunity, he lost it. But if you keep giving yourself up, you'll burn yourself out. And you have to establish that. They may get pissed off. I had a guy this week do it to me. Are you gonna leave? Yeah, I'm gonna leave. I was here all day, but guess what? He came earlier the next day because he knew I was going to leave. He knew I wasn't playing that, but I have to protect myself because at the end of the day, we want to have a career doing this. We don't want to burn out. People will burn you out if you let them, but you have to establish what is important in your life. All right, hobbies, pick one, do one, have it. Whatever, whatever floats your boat, you need to turn your brain up at some point in time. Just get out there and do that. Find something, okay? I know it sounds simple, but say, yeah, I want to I want to learn the guitar. I want to do this. Just do that. Go out and do it. It's, it's such a great way of just mentally taking your brain off of things for a little while. And when you come back to the problem, it's never quite as bad as it was the first time. The other thing too, I think for ourselves as athletic trainers, we're always expected to know all the answers, all right? And it's so important to do positive self-talk. What does that mean? It means that sometimes you just got to motivate yourself. There's no one's going to be saying, hey, man, keep going. You're doing a great job. You usually don't get that. So you got to talk to yourself. The Bible says, as a man thinks, so he goes. Joyce Myers said, you can't have a positive life with a negative mind. Kind of makes sense, right? But even that, how you talk about yourself, what you say about yourself, if you speak negative about negative about negative things, negative things, you start becoming negative. The more you speak positive about things, your life, it gets inside of you and it brings you up. So I think it's such an important thing to understand like how we speak really determines how we're gonna react. So speaking, you know, you know people like who's like, oh my God, this guy or lady is so negative and they wanna bring you down, right? But you can't allow that. You gotta to speak to yourself and encourage yourself and believe in yourself as you go through your day. Uh, communicate, and I think this is an important part because it kind of goes back with the politics. Develop proper communication channels. Like for me, if someone really wants to get a hold of me and they email me, first thing I do is don't email me because I may not read that till about seven o'clock at night. If you want me, call me, text me. That's me. There are certain people who go, oh no, don't you ever call me. <laughs> I want you to email me. That's fine, but let me know how you roll because the better you can communicate with certain people, some just want it one-on-one. -on -one. That's fine, but learn how people communicate in your job, your, your coaches, your athletic directors, how they do it. Learn how they communicate best. It's gonna make your job so much easier, all right? The other thing too, I think for me, I had to communicate to my family when I got home from work, when the kids were small and everything, they came and I, I wasn't the nicest person for the first five minutes, correct? <laughs> my wife's here. <laughs> 
But I said, just give me five. When I get home, just give me five minutes to kind of decompress. I just need that five to kind of whew, let it go. Um, we live further away now, so I have that time in the car, but before I lived really close and I had to communicate that to them, like if after five minutes, I'm gonna be okay. But let people know what you need. Don't be afraid to say, I need these things from you, okay? Obviously, I, talking about boundaries again, to me, super, super important. Stick to your treatment times. I think for athletic trainers, sitting down with the coaches and the athletic directors and your bosses before the season occurs, what times are you going to cover and what times are you not going to cover? Like, oh, you weren't at our night practice? No, I told you I'm not going to be there past six o'clock. Whatever you guys decide, stick to it. Because I, I think right now, I think Becca told me junior college is now – maybe have to deal with not only their spring sports, but their fall sports that were missed by COVID. Now the trainers got the expected to cover that. Oh my gosh, that's two seasons into one. What's going to happen to those trainers mentally, psychologically, emotionally? These are all things that came their way. We didn't expect COVID to happen, but still now that it happened, have those conversations in the beginning of the season with your people who are above you saying, Hey, these are, these are the times that are required. This is what's going on. Uh, I went the wrong way. Keep learning. Keep going to Con Ed. Con Ed will continue to have more wisdom. You'll have ability to understand things more. You'll have less frustration. Don't ever stop learning. We, no one knows it all, okay? Get some really good Instagram posts. They're quick and, and they just kind of provoke thought. And it's kind of nice to do that. We're professionals. We always want to get better. And I think it's fun for us to learn new things that are really effective. And then the athlete comes back and goes, wow, that really helped me. That makes us feel good. So use those things. Um, use your drive time to listen to podcasts. Lose the things that are going to kind of uplift you. And use those times to kind of support yourself mentally and physically. Those are the times we need those helps, okay? Um, one of the mentors in my life was an old chiropractor. He pulled me aside when I was younger. He said, until you learn this, you're going to struggle. And he said, it's an 80-10-10 rule. I said, all right, what's the 80-10-10 rule? He said, 80% of people, you're going to get better. All right. 10%, you'll kind of help. And there's going to be 10% of people that you deal with, you'll never get them better. Learn to accept that. So it sounds kind of like, that's kind of a negative, but it's actually real. Because there's a lot of people come in and I see, I go, I don't think I can help you. But... I can refer you to somebody who maybe can, and that still makes me feel better. I think as athletic trainers, we tend to have this savior complex. We have to be the knowledge of all and save everybody. That's not our job. Our job is to do the best we can. If we can't help them, maybe somebody else can, but that's okay because we're not designed to be the 100% all the time. Don't put that on yourself. It's unrealistic. Nobody can treat everyone and get everyone better. That's why we're all different and we have different skills and different things. So don't ever put yourself in that box. And that, that kind of gave me a perspective, like took the pressure off me. Like, okay, I don't have to be perfect. I'm going to try hard, but I'm not going to cure everybody. As athletic trainers, you have to compartmentalize. You can't let one thing lead into the other, okay? Because when you have multiple problems, not if, but when it's going to happen, there's going to be multiple things going on at the same time. How do you, how do you deal with it? It really gets back to the same thing. What's really vital. Okay. And what's trivial. I'll never forget. I was at a practice. I won't mention the coach's name. He's pretty famous. And my friend was the head of our trainer. And at the same time, his pencil broke on his pad as he's coaching. He was doing some notes and a player went down and he screamed at the trainer get my pencil, get my pencil, right? And the trainer is looking at him and there's a guy on the ground rolling in pain. Now he had to make a decision. This guy was a pretty famous coach. He did the right thing, took care of the player. But you have to understand what's vital, what's not vital, because you're gonna get pressures from all around, okay? Um, and it's a skill. It's definitely a skill to compartmentalize. It's, it's, it's easy to let one thing flow into the next, but you have to understand the next athlete that comes your way had nothing to do with that situation. And you got to somehow put a wall up and say, all right, I got you. I'm going to deal with you. I'll deal with that later. It's hard. It takes time. But the more you do that, the less stress you'll have. I'm going to leave you with this. You got to fight, fight, fight. You got to fight every day. It's an everyday fight. Okay. 
we're givers. It's fulfilling. It changes lives. Um, but we have to be deliberate in what we do each and every day. Be a planner. Deliberately do things that are going to build you up inside, okay? Because you know why? We love what we do. Our profession is worth fighting for, all right? So that's, for me, these really are some things that I just practically that I've, I've done in my life. I've been fortunate to have people kind of help me with this. And I got to 38 years, still married. I'm still mentally here, I think. So it's worked so far. But uh, now it's my pleasure for the next speaker to introduce Mark Strickland. He's a sports psychologist. He's currently with the Oakland A's and the Arizona Cardinals here. Um, he's helped a lot of athletes. He's helped me personally on a personal level and professionally. He has taught me a lot of things to identify in our athletes, which he's going to speak about today, that are so cool, so effective, and doesn't put you in an awkward position, like you're actually going crossing the line of being inappropriate, or it actually is very natural. And he's been a big help for us at the Arizona Cardinals, just allowing uh, us to see a different side because the healthier that the athlete is mentally, the quicker they're going to get back on the field and be prepared. So. Without further ado, Dr. Mark Strickland. Thank you. So, so as Brett mentioned, I, um, I am a sports psychologist uh, and a licensed psychologist here in uh, Arizona as well as in California. And I do work for the Oakland A's as well as have a private practice where I work with a lot of uh, Olympic athletes as well. So today I'm just gonna try to highlight some of the issues around mental health and mental uh, wellness for athletes um, and really start a discussion or help you start a discussion with your athletes uh, in your training rooms um, about mental health and mental wellness. So we'll start this with a question for you to ask yourself. Um, how often do you talk to athletes about mental health? Uh, in your day-to-day -day interactions with your athletes in the training room, um, or on the field, how often are you talking about mental health and mental wellness? And this may differ by uh, your situation. Uh, in the NCAA, there's been a big push for mental health and mental wellness. Um, so there may be more resources for you versus if you're in a high school or a junior college or in some sort of facility. Um, but I, at the end of this talk, I hope that you're able to feel confident to be able to start those conversations with your athletes. So just a few statistics here. Right, one in five adults, 20% of Americans live with a mental illness. Um, so if you think again about your population, 20% uh, of the people you're serving probably are struggling with some sort of mental health condition at this time, right? And, and these vary in severity and duration, obviously under times of COVID, um, those numbers have greatly inflated because of all the um, stressors that have come about with furloughs and masks and fears of, uh, families getting sick and things like that. Um, prevalence were higher among women than men, uh, but realize that the reporting of that may be a little bit inaccurate, right? I think men tend to underreport some of their own mental health uh, symptoms and symptomology. Um, young athletes or young adults have the highest rates of prevalence. And statistically speaking, um, most people experience their first mental health emergency or crisis between the 18, ages of 18 to 21. So again, if you think about your population, if you're in that high school uh, or upper high school area, or you're in that collegiate setting, uh, they may, this may be the first time an individual has actually experienced a mental health issue. They may not have the language for it. They may not quite understand it. There may be a lot of denial around it. So it's really important for you to be sensitive and understanding like how their experience may be for them. Um, and then obviously highest was, uh, rates among biracial individuals followed by Caucasian adults. So it really doesn't matter your gender, your sex, uh, your age, uh, your socioeconomic status, everyone is affected by mental health. So let's look at the treatment side of things. Of those 46, roughly 50 million people who suffer from mental health issues, only about 50% of them are getting treatment, right? Just think about it. There's about 150,000 ACLs a year. What if only 75%, 75,000 of those people got treatment? We had 75,000 people a year walking around with a bad knee hamper them the rest of their lives, right? So we spend a lot of time on the physical side, right? We treat things, we, we won't, you know, range emotions back, we won't strength back, we won't functional movement back. But if you've lived with something for 20 years, a mental health condition, anxiety, depression, um, bipolar disorder, think about the impact of it economically on your life, um, 
from a relationship standpoint, right? So you have a real opportunity as an athletic trainer to have an impact on that person not living with this mental health condition until later in their life, right? So um, we see more women, again, again, more women seek treatment than men. Um, and as you age, typically people have the resources to seek treatment, right? So as we age, we get insurance, we, we have some awareness of our circumstances, maybe we get tired of living uh, in these circumstances. And so that's when we're more apt to seek treatment. But if we can attach those young adults that are very often experiencing their first mental health crisis with quality treatment, how much greater of an impact can we have on the quality of their life throughout the rest of their, their days? So let's look at mental ath for athletes, elite athletes. Uh, there's a seminal study here, uh, the, the Olympic, uh, Olympic um, International Olympic Committee um, commissioned because a lot of people think elite athletes don't have mental health issues, right? Oh, you're rich, uh, you're on TV, uh, you're successful, you have all of these things. Um, but really what we've discovered is the rates for athletes are no different from the general population, right? Prevalence rates for issues of alcohol addiction and anxiety and depression are really pretty much similar to the general population. And more importantly, we've started to see athletes speak openly about mental health conditions. Kevin Love talking about having a panic attack. Um, Brandon Marshall talking about his issues in the NFL. Um, and the list goes on. Serena Williams talking about her issues with depression and stuff. And the challenge for an athlete is they can't always take a day off, right? If the game is tomorrow and the, or the championship is tomorrow or next week, they don't always have the freedom to say, whoa, I need to take a mental health day and go do this, or I need to miss practice so that I can go attend this appointment or this group session or go to rehab or whatever it is. So those are, there are a lot of stressors for athletes. Well, yes, they're successful. Yes, they have resources. Yes, they have money but their opportunities are sometimes limited. And also their lives are public. Um, if I tear my ACL, it's not in the paper the next day, right? It is for an athlete. If I go to treatment and go see my psychologist tomorrow, there's no comment about it. The coach doesn't have to talk about it. The athletic director doesn't have to report it to the media. So that issue of stigma also comes about and also can be a prevention of why sometimes athletes seek those services out. So as an athletic trainer, what should you talk about? Right, Brett talked about sleep earlier. Sleep is an important issue on a variety of levels, right? Um, it's, a, it's classically a symptom of a lot of mental health conditions. If you look at the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which we use to classify mental health conditions as psychologists, sleep is a categorized uh, symptom in a lot of mental health conditions. So talking about sleep is very important, especially with young athletes, right? It impacts a lot of bodily systems, hormonal, cognitive, um, you know, your endocrine systems, right? And it also impacts decision-making, right? Why do athletes make poor decisions? Uh, we traveled across time zones, we didn't sleep, um, you know, we're anxious, we are also over aroused um, in the game and then, then we make poor choices, right? Um, so we have to understand that sleep is, is directly impacting decision-making of all, all humans, right? And think about that uh, the less sleep you get, the more impaired you are. And a lot of people go, oh, I've just gotten used to only getting four hours a night. Well, that's actually inaccurate. We've looked at driving studies and we know that those deficits of getting poor sleep or inac in inadequate sleep, um, those are cumulative and you don't adjust to them. You just keep getting worse. The problem is you don't realize you're getting worse with your decision-making right? Um, so it, things like insomnia are associated with increases of suicide and obviously concussions, depending on the sport you, you serve as an athletic trainer, poor sleep has also put you at a greater risk for concussions. So again, what do we talk about? Brett talked about it earlier, uh, self-talk, right? Not only yourself, what are you saying to yourself, uh, dealing with burnout or dealing with crises on the field, um, but what are your athletes say? You know, I always say the um, training room is kind of the barbershop. Everyone comes in and everyone talks about whatever. They may be talking about relationship problems. They may be talking about poor grades in school. They may be talking about family issues. So as an athletic trainer, if you kind of keep your ear to the ground, you hear a lot of information, right? And as you get to know your athletes and you build relationships with them, and you build trust, um, understanding what their self-talk is like uh, is very important because what you want to recognize is, is it changing? 
under stressful conditions, what are athletes doing and saying to themselves? During exam weeks, right? Are they turning really negative because the pressure of exams and having to perform and we've got to travel and I don't have enough time to go to this class. Um, is that changing their self-talk, right? Is that stress level increasing and their self-talk is, is becoming less positive, right? How does it impact them? How does it impact their mood? How does it impact their relationships uh, romantically with friends, with coaching staffs? Um, and so it's important for you to kind of keep you know, keep your ears open. Now, you may be treating this individual, but on the tables next to you, you may pick up some tidbits and recognize that, oh, this person's trending in this direction, or there's starting to be a change in their behavior that I need to sort of pay attention to and monitor over time. So what else do we want to talk about? We want to talk about trauma, right? Uh, trauma is really misunderstood uh, in the athletic world, um, and we're just starting to understand its effects on uh, the athletic population. But again, if you think about your, the people you treat in the training room you're in, 50% of women experience sexual violence in their lifetime, right? 20% of men experience sexual violence in their lifetime, right? And what we know is a study here that I listed on, from the British Journal of Sports Medicine, injury rates for athletes who have experienced a traumatic event go up, right? For the triathletes in this one study, um, five point. 5.4 injuries per thousand hours of training, 17.4 injuries per thousand hours of racing, which was statistically significant above those who were not, uh, who had not experienced a traumatic event in their lifetime, right? But trauma and injury are strongly correlated. I do a lot of trauma work in my private practice. Um, athletes who've been sexually uh, molested, people who've um, dealt with traumatic experience, PTSD, think about a catastrophic injury an ACL tear, um, a broken limb, those are, those are traumatic experiences. They're scary, they're fearful. They, they create a lot of uh, changes in our body from a cellular neurological level, right? And some athletes don't always return to perform. Um, so what we really wanna understand is that when a trauma occurs, but whether on or off the field, there is a relationship between that trauma and that athlete moving forward. I used to work in a chronic pain facility and the research says that about 50% of people who uh, suffer from chronic pain have, an, have a, pre, there's a prevalence of trauma in their background. Well, in my experience working in that facility for a year, it was 100% of the people I was treating chronic, who dealt with chronic pain, regardless of what that chronic pain syndrome was, they had some sort of traumatic experience in their earlier lifetime. So talking about trauma, talking about and understanding family dynamics, um, relationship dynamics. Those are important pieces of information because it may impact the way you treat and the way that person heals, right? On a, on a social, emotional level. So again, suicide. It's important to talk about. It's a very scary thing. Even as a, as a psychotherapist, sometimes talking about suicide can be very difficult. But it's important to understand that talking about suicide does not increase the likelihood of a suicide attempt. Right. Uh, there's some resources I have at the end, but the Columbia Lighthouse Project is an excellent um, program where they train practitioners across the spectrum, physicians, athletic trainers, physical therapists, psychologists, coaches, whoever wants to be trained in how to um, be aware of what suicide is and, and how to impact someone who may be suicidal. And they have these six questions. Um, and you, you just start with the first question is, um, have you ever wished you were dead or wish you could go to sleep and not wake up? If they say yes, then you move on. If they say no, the, the assessment kind of stops right there, but it's really a good um, hard and fast assessment. You can put the card in your pocket or in your treatment bag and take it with you. That way, if you ever have a, um, a concern, boom, it's right there and available to you. But we know that talking about research does not, or talking about suicide does not increase the likelihood. And when you ask someone about it, if we look at the studies and we, and we talk to uh, suicide survivors, we know that if somebody would have just asked them if they're okay, we probably could have prevented that suicide attempt. So sometimes just asking the question, even though you don't know what to do with the answer, might actually have such an impact on that person knowing that there's someone in their world that cares, right? Even if it's just for that few minutes, there's something that they can cling to because hopelessness is actually the greatest predictor 
of suicide. And if someone's lost hope and that you reach out and you extend that olive branch to them and you show that you care, right? You may be able to have a significant impact on their life from in that moment and moving forward. So what to look for? Uh, from a mental health issue, I don't expect any of you to be uh, mental health clinicians. That's not your role, right? But you are on the front line. Like I said, it's the barbershop. You're hearing a lot of information. You're hearing stories. You're hearing people's change in mood and behavior. So you need to recognize a few key elements, right? Uh, mental health conditions change from duration and severity. Um, we'll take the exa example of depression. Um, you know, if someone, uh, my girlfriend, say, broke up with me, I might be sad for a few days. That would be a normal response. But if it's lingering on for two and three and four weeks, that, may, that response may be atypical to the situation. So that's what you want to look for. Is the response typical and appropriate, or is it more severe than what you would expect given the, the challenge of the event, right? Um, what are the changes across time, right? Are we noticing um, patterns to this person's behavior? Um, are we beha noticing behavioral inconsistency? You know, you ask them how they're doing and they start crying, but they say they're fine. Those are behavioral inconsistencies, right? They, those two things don't add up. So you may have to challenge that. I don't really think you're fine because you're crying at the same time. What's going on, right? Um, what is the treatment history for them, right? You may know their physical treatment history. They've had this injury, they've had this, they've been in the training room, they, we've documented all this stuff. What about their mental health treatment history? Have they connected with the counseling center on campus? Have they seen someone as a kid before they came, let's say, to your university? Um, is there family history? Um, you know, we need to ask these things. I think the NCAA is really just starting to scratch the surface with this or do it starting to regulate and mandate uh, pre-participation mental health physicals, right? So at the high school level, obviously there's some consent issues and parents and things like that, but understanding like we may need to start asking a few of these questions, simple questions about sleep, diet, um, you know, family histories, treatment histories, so that we understand where the athlete is when they first come to us, right? You do a lot of range of motion screens, so the first time you, you treat an athlete, why wouldn't you want to know a little bit about their mental and emotional health as well? How do you talk to your clients? Well, for new clients, it's really easy. You just build it into your, your screen. You know, you probably have a list of questions in your head or, or, or a, a document that you go through and you check some boxes. You know, have you ever had this injury? Have you ever had that injury? How, how tall are you? you? You take range of motion measurements. You take strength measurements. Just build it into your pre-participation screen, you know? You can ask simple questions about their personal history. Have you ever seen a mental health provider for any conditions in the past? No? Okay, great. You know, if, if so, yes. What for? How long were you in treatment? Um, did, was treatment resolved? Did you complete treatment? Or do you feel like you might need to, are you still seeing that person? You know, those are just little things you would want to know. Um, ask about their training history. That might give you a lot of information. Like, oh yeah, I trained really well during this year, but then you know, the, my sophomore year, I, you know, I, I didn't train very well and, and my performance wasn't really good. Was there something different between your freshman and your sophomore year? Oh, you, you, you injured your ACL. Well, how did that affect you? You know, how did it affect your mood? How did you, did you feel really motivated to go to rehab every day? And, and how is your leg feeling now? Um, what are your goals as an athlete? Oh, well, I want, you know, I'm, I'm five foot two, but I want to play in the NBA. Oh, wow. That's a, that's a really big goal. Is that person a perfectionist? Is that, are those goals indicating to me that they may be inconsistent with like their behaviors? They don't ever show up for practice, but they want to play professional sports. Um, so those are things. Injury history, acute versus chronic. Again, those chronic injuries, someone who's coming to you who's always chronically injured, you may need to look a little deeper and see if there's things that might be impacting their ability to rehab and perform. Um, and again, mental health history. Ask about sleep. How often do you, how many hours a night of sleep do you get on average? Um, are there things that impact your sleep on a regular basis? Um, ever suffered from insomnia, you know, where you might go two or three days where you, you can't sleep at all, you know? Those are indications of maybe a bipolar issue. There may be a depressive issue. There may be anxiety issue. Um, things that th those things correlate to that you could then expand upon, you know, you talk about, um, you know, substance abuse and abuse, 
you know, how often do you use alcohol or drugs? You know, obviously marijuana has is is become legal in many states. So that's going to be a new challenge. How is the NCAA, how uh, the NBA just uh, today indicated that they weren't going to do random drug screens for uh, marijuana this year. Uh, so, so that culture is changing. So you as an athletic trainer, um, if a athlete shows up intoxicated or high, but it's legal, like where does that, that stick for you? How do you treat them? I know as a psychotherapist, somebody comes to my office and they've been using drugs or alcohol, I will not treat them, right? That's your scheduled appointment, but I'm not going to see you because you're not in a state where I can accurately assess your mood, right? So those may be things that you have to look for and look a little closer for depending on where you live, right? Um, and then just the simple question, tell me more, right? That gives the athlete an opportunity to tell and talk to you about what they're comfortable with at their pace, right? Sometimes as a, as a psychotherapist, I have to sit there and go, I need more information to help this person, but I know they're not ready yet. The relationship is not strong enough yet. That trust, that bond has not been built. So if I give them permission to just give me what they're comfortable with, that's where we'll start. Um, again, noticing changes in behavior. That's your opportunity as an athletic trainer to step in and go, what's going on? I've noticed that you struggling with this. I noticed that you're a little off today. I noticed that you seem sad or extremely happy, or I noticed you're really tired today. You fell asleep while I was, you know, doing a flush on your knee, you know? So those are opportunities for you to, again, just dig a little bit and give them an opportunity to share. Um, Open-ended questions. Um, you know, I noticed that you don't seem interested in practice today. Are they burned out? You know, are they depressed? Um, are they tired? Um, are they undernourished? You know, looking at things like, um, you know, you haven't been showing up regularly. Well, if they're not showing up regularly and they don't have a class and there's not, a, there's not an explanation for it, what's going on? You know, why is that inconsistency there? Um, and then don't let them get away without giving you some specifics, you know. It's your not, your, not ever your job as an athletic trainer to treat them. I don't tape ankles, right? I'm a psychologist. I don't tape ankles. So... You're, you're an athletic trainer, you're not going to treat their mental health, but you're going to help them identify what's going on. And you're also going to help point them in the right direction to where the experts are. So again, mental health affects every facet of an athlete's life, just like an injury affects multiple facets of an athlete's life, right? Um, you know, if left untreated, mental health conditions will not resolve themselves, right? Just like an ACL tear will not fix itself. It might scar over, right? But it's not gonna fix itself. So we wanna make sure that we're helping people find the need and find the resources that will help them. Um, you don't have to be the expert. Again, going back to kind of Brett's talk about burnout, some of you may feel like you need to be the expert because you don't have a lot of resources. Maybe you work at a small school, there's not a lot of money in the budget, there's not a lot of equipment, right? So create a referral network. Right? I can't enforce it enough. Ta Brett talked about having mentors. That's key for you in your development, but developing resources in your community. Where are mental health providers? Uh, LCSWs, uh, marriage and family therapists, um, addiction specialists, uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, having those numbers readily available to you and someone who understands the uniqueness of an athletic population um, will make your job just that much easier. Because when you need that number and you have it in a phone or posted on the wall in your office, it just makes your life simpler, right? It makes that referral process simpler for you and the athlete, right? Talking about mental health does not create mental illness. And I really want, mental illness is, is a scary word but I, for athletes. I really want to shift that conversation to mental health and mental wellness. Just like we got, encourage them to go to the gym to get strong so they don't injure themselves, why not encourage them to seek mental health and wellness services so that they don't incur a mental health issue, right? We can head that off in the past um, before it happens. Creating a safe space, like I said, it's the barbershop of the, the, the training rooms, kind of the barbershop of the world. That's a safe space, creating the safe space. What is the language that's used not only by yourself, but by the other athletes in the room? Um, giving hope to the athlete. Um, decreasing that stigma around mental health and mental, mental illness, right? 
And then again, refer, 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 and having that referral network. So how do you refer? Because sometimes this is a very complex and difficult process because denial can be very strong, right? If, if we have an x-ray and the bone is broken, it's pretty easy to say, this is the step. But with mental health, it can be a little nebulous. Oh, I'm just having a bad day. Or, oh, I'm not that sad. Or, oh, this thing explains why I feel this way. You know, and, and again, culturally and societally in our country, thankfully, people are starting to recognize that mental health is very important. Um, but understand there's still stigma. There's still stigma in certain cultures, um, in certain regions, um, male versus female. So you as an athletic trainer, again, because of your relationship, you might be the one person who can actually sit that athlete down and say, I'm really concerned about you, right? Let's get you some help. And, and getting away from words like, oh, this person's just crazy. They need to go see the shrink. Coaches do that enough, right? It's hard enough to get coaches to, you know, to change their language. Don't be a part of that. Don't feed into that. You know, you may have to make that referral several times. You may have to give someone that card for that clinician two or three or four times, you know. Um, you may have to follow up with them. Hey, did you make that call today? No? Well, hey, let's come on in my office and let's make that call together. You know, I can help you with that. You know, I've sent a bunch of athletes to this person. They've all felt like that person really heard them. It was really helpful for them. You know, that way they, there's a little bit, oh, this person understands athletes. Okay, maybe it's a little bit, a little, little less scarier for them. You know, talk about personal experience if you're comfortable doing that. Um, you may need to attend that appointment with them. That may be difficult um, because of scheduling and time, but you may be, have to help get them to that facility, right? Um, we know that if they have an ACL tear, there's nothing wrong with taking the person in the van and going over to the orthopedist's office. Why not taking them over to the psychologist's office? Let's, let's eliminate those barriers that athletes may put up that make it more difficult to, to achieve the goal of, of their mental health and wellness, right? So identifying those barriers, is it money? You know, is it, uh, do you have insurance? Uh, is it this provider take that insurance? What's the copay? You know, so you can, you can chip away at some of those barriers so that athletes understand, like, this is really valuable for me. So a few tips and tricks just to add here towards the end. Um, make the discussion about mental health a regular part of the training room. Just like you talk about strength conditioning, nutrition, diet, all those things, make it a regular part of the training room conversations, right? Every time an athlete opens up and talks about it, does an interview, um, make that a part of the daily conversation. Hey, did you see the interview with Kevin Love? Did you read this article? Um, I post articles all the time um, through our Teamworks app, and um, I slap them on the wall in a folder, and I'll put 10 or 12 of them in, in there, and you'll, by the we, end of the week, those articles are gone. They're looking for something to read. It's interesting. It's relevant. It, um, it's, you know, it's stimulating to them. Um, like I said, post that information. Um, discuss your concerns with the other healthcare providers, team physicians, physical therapists, other athletic trainers to make sure that, you know, you're seeing the whole picture. You know, you know, I was really worried about Billy the other day and you're talking to orthopedist. Yeah, well, he's towards ACL, you know, health surgery. No, I was really worried he's really down. Like, did you see that when, he, when you were evaluating him in your office, you know, three days post-op? Did you notice a change in his mood or, or, or his language? You know, did you see that? You know, and, look, and talk about that over time. Obviously, confidentiality is an issue, so you need to make sure that you um, have those releases, but get the rest of the staff involved. So everybody's eyes are in tune to noticing those cognitive and emotional changes, not just the physical elements. Um, and like we discussed earlier, never hesitate to ask an athlete how they're doing, right? You may be the one person who's, who's done it that day or that week or that month, and it may change the course of their life, right? So I'll end with a question. What is preventing you as an athletic trainer from talking to your athlete about mental health now, right? I don't expect you to be the expert. No one does, but we do understand that as an athletic trainer, you have a resource, you have access, you have intimate ability to sit with that athlete during treatment, during taping, during practice, and have those difficult conversations and help them get to the place 
where they can get the treatment, the services that they need. Last thing, I'll just add a few references here. Um, the International Olympic Committee uh, statement is actually on uh, British Journal of Sports Medicine. It's a public access, it's free. Um, it's an excellent article. Um, there's a recent article out by Michael Grander, who's the U of A um, on sleep and athletic performance. And it talks about how sleep impacts athletic performance. Uh, the National Institutes of Mental Health has great um, documents that you can post around your training room. Um, and then the Columbia Lighthouse Project, um, they will actually come in and do uh, trainings on suicide education. Um, like I said, they're not trying to train everyone. Uh, everyone doesn't have to be a, a licensed medical practitioner. They train police and fire and coaches, and they do a wonderful job. I've been to one of their trainings uh, through an MLB workshop. So uh, if you have interest, uh, connect them. That's their website. Connect with them. And uh, and you can download that card and have it available and have it available for your coaches as well. Again, I thank, thank you for your time. Thank you for taking your Saturday and your busy schedule to uh, be a part of this. And uh, with no uh, further ado, I'll turn it back over to Brett and we'll go from there. Both roles require team collaboration. Any advice on how to approach keeping colleagues accountable so you don't end up doing everything yourself? I'll take it first. Um, I would say don't assume that you have to do their work. If you want to hold athletes or athletes and or uh, colleagues accountable, um, then they have to be consequenced when they're not, when they don't complete their tasks. Um, whether that's a head athletic trainer and a, a intern or something like that, um, or it's um, a team position or an athletic trainer, I think it's really defining whose jobs and roles are um, and then the accountability piece is that when they don't achieve their goal or they don't reach the level of accountability, what is the consequence to that? Right. Great answer. Next question. Uh, Brett, this is for you. Hmm. Burnout as an entrepreneur versus an employee. Wow. That's a great question. Burnout as an owner or as an employee. Um, it's amazing. I've had the ability to be on both sides of this. And obviously being an owner, you have so many other responsibilities that employees don't always realize, nor there should be, because you know you have other things like payroll and marketing and things like that. Um, but it's, I think it's even more important for an entrepreneur to find other entrepreneurs who've been through this. And I know me, I've been really fortunate here in the Valley and I had other physical therapists I was able to call say, man, how do you handle this? And, and it really helped me out to go and do that. So there was a unique situation because I have some problems that that I couldn't go to my employees were because there were things that were just ownership type problems and they're unique. And finding those people who do have a business sense or who have other problems, other situations very similar, it's such an important part to reach out to those people. And how do you meet them? You meet them at seminars, you meet them other places, other places where PTs get together or ATCs get together and you start building that network and you start having that right in your phone. Say, I can call that person going, hey, and it's fun because they'll actually call you with other questions and you can kind of help each other out. How would you, so let's say it's not you experiencing burnout, it's your colleagues. How would you guys suggest um, talking to them? And if you don't mind repeating, because they said they can't hear me if I say it. Okay, go ahead. So the question is, uh, what if your colleague is experiencing burnout? How do you, how do you talk to them? Um, for me as a psychologist, um, I, I just kind of pull that person aside or I make an appointment with them, you know, take them to lunch, get away from the facility, get away from the demands of the athletes, the coaches, whatever's around you and go, I, I have a concern. You know, I'm worried about you in this way. I'm noticing you're showing up late or I'm noticing that you're not as interested in uh, treatment anymore or your paperwork is always late. So you identify the behaviors that you think are consistent with the burnout. And then you go, how can I help you? You know, I, you may not be able to change their schedule. You may not be able to change the job tasks, um, but you may be able to help them identify the changes they need to make in their life. Um, that would be the way I would approach it. And cause you want to do it in a non-threatening way. So that's why you do it away from the facility or away from the training room, because it gives them the freedom to open up and go, yeah, I am. I'm not doing these things as well. And this is why, or, and if there's denial, just like a referral, you may have to have that conversation multiple times. You may have to have that conversation with them 
two or three or four times before they really allow themselves to identify that, yeah, I'm, I'm struggling here with changes. And I, for me, I think this is where Mark helped me the most in that he said earlier in his talk, it's not our job as ATCs to treat this, but he made me more aware of some of the symptoms that a coworker could be having and have that conversation because we have a relationship and say, I, I think we can get you some help. And um, I think our job is to really identify that there is a problem and then get the appropriate help from the professionals that do this for a living to get them there. Uh, how would you handle if the issue is that you're not feeling valued or that you feel like your supervisor is not hearing your concerns that you personally have? Um, I think number one is, is the yes, the uh, question is if you are undervalued and your boss doesn't really understand what you do, there's lack of communication, um, what do you do? What do you do if, it's, if you're frustrated because you really have no voice? I think, you, first of all, you go to that person one-on-one -on -one at a time, say, hey, is there a time we can get together quietly? You never do it in front of a bunch of people, okay? You pull them aside and you say, is there an opportunity we can speak? And you have that opportunity to speak and express yourself and maybe it was misunderstanding and you correct it, great. If that does not happen, then obviously you may be in the wrong situation. You may be in a situation where that job isn't gonna change and you need to change your job because not everybody has a great boss. <laughs> so you need to identify that, but it, you always need to go to that person one-on-one -on -one and never do it in front of somebody else. At least make the attempt to at least to try understand them as much as you want them to understand you. Thank you. From a psychological, the question, question is, does, uh, do we see the fact that COVID may have a long-term effect on uh, athletes? Um, yes. The simple answer is yes. Um, the unintended consequences of COVID are yet to be discovered. Um, athletes are having to stay in college longer because there's not opportunities to go pro. Um, athletes are having respiratory illnesses that, um, you know, they were able to run and do all their sport work uh, with no problems. And now they have contracted COVID and the respiratory effects of that may be felt for decades. Who knows? We don't know yet. Um, from an emotional standpoint, the stress of COVID, being away from friends, being unable to train, not knowing when the next competition may happen. Um, even if it's a competition scheduled, can I get there safely? Um, do I get there and it's canceled all of a sudden last minute because of, you know, a balloon of cases. And so I think the uncertainty of COVID and the uncertainty that we've lived with now chronically, you know, initially we thought, oh, this will be a month or two. Um, now we're looking at well into a year and possibly longer, even with a vaccine uh, potentially on the, on the horizon. Um, that uncertainty, that anxiety that's created by that uncertainty <laughs> will certainly have long-term lasting effects for athletes, coaches, athletic trainers, and just everyone in this population. Chip, thanks for that question. I had a personal situation. Uh, my son plays college football, and they had their spring season canceled. And he was putting all his efforts as a walk-on freshman to make the team and do all these different things. And all of a sudden, boom, it's gone. And he called really frustrated. So what I did, I called Mark. <laughs> Mark, what do I tell him? And, and, you know, he had some really good advice. He said, basically, his season's over. So treat it like his season's over. And he said something, too, that my son really resonated with. He said, it's okay to be angry. Go be angry. It's okay to be angry. You got a season taken away from you. That's okay. That's a normal response. Don't think it's not normal. So go ahead and be angry. But then go and go to the beach with your friends and have fun and just let yourself go for a few weeks and then we'll regroup. And it really helped him. So thanks for the question. And like I said, it, that's a big, big, big thing. Because here they are, they go into a game, and all of a sudden it's canceled or the season's canceled. And all of a sudden, everything's turned upside down for them. Yeah, yeah no, I, thanks for inviting me. Uh, you know, it's been a pleasure. Um, if you have questions, there's my email, uh, my phone. You can contact me if you have future questions or, or need re referrals or resources. Um, I will list two referrals or uh, resource opportunities. Um, the Association for Applied Sports Psychology as a consultant finder. So depending on where you live in the country, 
um, that's a good way to connect to a sports psychology professional in your community and or the um, American Psychological Association Division of 47. That's the Sport and Exercise Psychology Division. There's also resources on there for mental health uh, uh, information for athletes as well. So, Great. And, and thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Um, I believe we have on the website, NATA has a section for, re for um, references of on the slide that if you do need help or resources for personal issues as well as athletes, it's up on the NATA website. But also too in the question part, if you can get some feedback to us how things went today, but also what you wanna see in the future for us to talk about. We're very fortunate here in Phoenix to have a lot of great experts we can bring in, make things really, really uh, practical and reasonable, keep it short and sweet and, and get the most out of it. So thank you for being here and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you.